the magnificent, unconquerable, unconquerable, un unparable, hallelujah, master of the universe, creator of all things, hallelujah, hallelujah. Aren't you glad tonight that you don't have to put your hope in Washington? Hello? Or in a politician? Right. Aren't you glad that you really don't have to put your hope in a preacher? or a man that's frail and human, but we have our hope in the one that cannot be diminished. He cannot be contained. He is self-existent. He's self-exalting. He's self-fulfilling. He's self-revealing. He doesn't need anybody or anything outside of himself at any time. He can't be denied. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can do anything for anyone, Hallelujah. I said, and he's your friend. You ought to be excited tonight. You ought to be excited tonight. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, if you could just see him as he wants you to see him, you wouldn't have all these little petty worries and, and concerns and anxieties and questions. If we could ever see him the way he wants us to, everything's just going to be all right. Everything's just going to be all right. You think you're in good hands with all state. I promise you're in good hands with Jesus. You're in great hands with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated for just a moment. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God has been so good to me. God has been so good to us. We are a blessed and privileged people just, just to know what we know. I thought this week about how many little tidbits of information come through the news media that just sparks the truths and principles. Sister Hino brought to me an article yesterday that she had read online about from a newspaper in Israel. And they were celebrating the fact that they had not elected, but appointed a high priest. A high priest. Israel has a high priest. There's been no animal sacrifices since the destruction of the temple when Babylon invaded. And they are anxiously awaiting. But what intrigued me, Brother Arnold, was the man writing this article says, we are so excited. This man has been vetted and everything is perfect. We have done our research, and he is now appointed. Israel has a high priest, and now we're waiting for the opportunity to begin animal sacrifices. And his words were, we hope that it will be this year. This was in the article. And I went back and just checked some notes and different resources to make sure I understood it is a fact that they cannot offer a sacrifice except in the temple. There's a certain place, a location, that the altar has to be erected on, a certain piece of ground, and they can't do it now. And he said the problems are not physical, the problems are political, but this is what caught my attention. He said they're soon to be resolved. In Israel will be able to offer the sacrifice. He said, we would love to be able to do it this year on the Day of Atonement, which is October the 4th, I believe, according to Jewish calendar. And when she, when she brought that to me, it has, it has just stirred my heart and connected with what Brother Hoffman, the statement Brother Hoffman made about we don't know the, the day or the hour, but we know the seasons. And he talked about the seasons of the fall, this fall. This September, to be exact, next month, when the, when the holiday festivities begin from Jewish perspective. And I said all that to say this. Lift up your eyes. There are many things that we can focus on in this world. Phil, we could focus on loss, focus on lost loved ones.
we could focus on the dilemmas and perplexities of America. But if we could just lift up our eyes as children of God and allow him to be high and lofty and lifted up, we'll see things that we cannot imagine. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for this wonderful people and this opportunity to give to your kingdom. We ask you to bless that which is received. Give us wisdom according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, singers. Hey, I think we ought to just give a little thanks for the how the music department has stepped up and kind of helped us this last month or so. Doing a good job. Doing a good job. Amen. Amen. And uh, as Brother Hynote said, please hold the Holly family up in prayer. And Michael left us, but uh, we need to pray for Karen. Calvin and Misty and Phil and Janice and Ray and Diane and Denny and Carol and, of course, Nana Holly and all the folks involved with this. God would bless them. Please continue to pray for Mary Woodard. We've been up there, Sister Treadway and I have been up at Shands to pray for. I've never seen anybody with a hip replacement as buoyant and as happy as that gal is. She just, she just smiling, you know. She must not have had my nurse. She's just smiling. <laughs> And, uh, and pray for, for Ellen Cormier. She was due to go out of, the, out of the place Friday, and the nurse's assistant came in and dislocated her leg for her and dislocated her old kneecap. That's why they call it the practice of medicine. So now they've taken her back in and put a full body cast from her leg all the way down till Friday because everything is swollen and they can't tell what's happened. And she's got a good attitude, you know, and... Uh, just pray for her that somehow Thursday or Friday when they take the cast off, the swelling will have gone down and, and everything will be okay so she can go home. Your paper cut isn't real big, is it? <laughs> I want to I wanna talk to you for a little while tonight if I could. And, and I'd like to apologize before I start because I'm, and I'm sorry I'm such a wussy, but I just... I'm having one of those terrible days that my vision is, is just crazy. I can't hardly see. And, uh, and I, I know I want to say something, but so if I'm just stumbling a little bit, just act like I'm really doing good, okay? I'm reading from uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, and uh, beginning with verse 1. And uh, I'm going to try to tie a few thoughts together. I, I was going to turn this over to Brother Hynote again tonight. He's done such a good job the last two Wednesdays. But I, uh, this is my last chance to talk at the age of 71. I won't be 71 anymore, and I just wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. That way, when I do lousy when I'm 72, you say, boy, you should have heard him when he was 71. Man, that guy, he could throw down when he was 71, but... He's pretty well through at 72. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I had a friend of mine call me and said, let's face it, Arnold, you're going to die in that pulpit. You ain't going nowhere. I said, you'll be surprised. Amen. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? Or what do you have in the house? And she said, Thine head may have not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, the, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And she went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. 
came to pass that when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Okay? I want to just try to pull a few thoughts together here. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about the issue is still the oil. The issue is still the oil. Lord, bless the teaching and help me to be able to see in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You, we both, or I should say we both, we all understand that there are many, many things in the scriptures that are symbols and symbolism. And they represent things. I looked up in the dictionary. It says symbolic. That which infers something. That which stands for something. That which represents something. A traffic sign. A sign on a restroom, a no smoking sign, a dove, an olive branch. They all are symbolic of something. Say amen. amen. But hear me now. But they are not the something. They are just symbolic of the something. Okay? You can have that dove all you want to. In fact, I had a guy quit this church because we put that dove up there. He said I was an idol worshiper. I helped raise that boy in this church. He looked at that thing and quit this church. He said, you're into idol worship. I said, you're into stupidity is what you are. Your brain is out somewhere in Istanbul. You're, you're nuts. And uh, he, he, he just quit. He said, I'm an idol worshiper. It's the joys of pastor. Wonder what he thought about the sign that was on the ladies' room. Uh-huh. Symbolic, that which refers to something or infers to something or stands for something. Substance, the real or essential part of something, the actual essence or material aspect, the actual item itself. My, my little Bible study or my dissertation tonight is simply uh, in reference to the question that I'm now going to present to me and to thee. Do we possess what we say we preach? Do we possess the presence of what we claim? Are we living in symbolism or are we embracing substance? It's not the same. I would be honest and safe to say that the majority of so-called churches today, especially so-called Christian churches, are baptized with living with symbolism. That they are not blessed and privileged to experience the substance. That it's all intellectual. It's all mind. It's all, I accepted the Lord and I got the Holy Ghost. You can't prove that by scripture. Paul talked to those 12 Baptists in Acts 19 and said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe, not when you believe? Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believe? So believing and receiving ain't the same issue. And they were very honest. These were 12 Baptist men who said, We never heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said, Until what were you baptized? Well, until John's baptism. Well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying you should believe on him that came after him. That's on Christ Jesus. When these 12 Baptists heard that, they said, Lead us to the water. Let's get rebaptized. And they got baptized in Jesus' name. When they came out, Paul laid his hands on them, and they traded symbol for substance. And I really think that's one of the, or it should be one of the big differences between Pentecostal apostolic people and the rest of the so-called Christian church. Do we possess the substance or are we just living with a symbol? And I really think that the issue is the oil. Because all through the scriptures, oil has always been symbolic of the spirit. Always. And, and David wrote in Psalms 10:27. he said, And I shall be anointed with fresh oil. 
For the last month or so, I have been praying and agonizing before God to uh, try to experience and receive in fulfillment what David actually meant, that I could be anointed with fresh oil. Because oil can get rancid. Oil can get stale. Let me go a little further. Oil can stop working. If you're a mechanic, oil can lose its viscosity and break down, and it's not lubricating what it's supposed to lubricate, although you put the stick in and say it's got six quarts, but it ain't got six quarts of stuff that's protecting. Let me try it again. And you and I can have the oil of the Holy Ghost, and if we don't get renewed and refreshed every once in a while, it can lose its ability to help us like it first did. Bible says in, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and, I, and Luke 14, 8 and 4, 18, and in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about healing all manners of disease and doing all kinds of good things. And he said to people, don't think that I do the works. My Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Well, he was talking about the anointing, the Spirit of God that was in him. I got to study and looking up that word anointing. It's a really amazing. Anointing and anoint comes from the Hebrew word, which means to smear. It's to smear, to cover. And it was indicative of, symbolic of, a person or an object being set apart. The vessels of the tabernacle were anointed. The priest was anointed. Kings were anointed. Prophets were anointed. Jesus of Nazareth was anointed. The early church was told to wait for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It will anoint you with power that you might be witnesses unto me. According to the book of Corinthians, chapter 1, it says, And the believers are anointed by God. And then when you read over in 1 John, I, I, I've had people debate with me over this. They challenged me. They tried to show I was a stupid jerk. When they would use that scripture in 1 John 2.27, they said, You need not that any man teach you, for you have an anointing. And I had a guy from this church tell me right to my face, I don't need to hear you. I have an anointing. I said, I agree with you. But, but you're taking the scripture out of context. Because John, if you read the previous verse and the, and the verse after, he is saying, I'm writing these things to you concerning them that are seducing you. In other words, in their church, they had false doctrine people and false teachers coming in and teaching false things to the people. And John said, you don't need anybody to come and teach you false doctrine. You got the Holy Ghost. You got an anointing that should bear witness that that ain't right. So he is not saying we do not need preachers and teachers because the scriptures are full of the scriptures that said, obey them that rule over you, for they watch for your soul, for they must give an answer. Listen to them that I've given counsel to. I will give you pastors after mine heart who will give you words of knowledge and wisdom to help you. That's crazy. Now, the other side of that is pastors have no right to be a dictator. We're, we're not a lord over God's heritage. We're just servants that are trying to share the word of God and the will of God with people. But don't ever buy into that stupid stuff that these people say, you have an anointing so you don't need to listen to the man. Because all the people of God were anointed when they came out of bondage. Listen to me carefully. That's what caused Korah to go into the pit. He challenged Moses and said, hey, all the people of the Lord are anointed. They're all holy. They're all redeemed. You take too much on yourself. May I say this kindly? Be careful. When you assault the anointed one that's over you. Doesn't mean you cannot challenge them. You cannot confront them. But you don't want to do it in a mob situation. 
And you don't want to get a whole group of people in and just attack him. The Bible says if you have ought against your brother, go to him in private and talk to him. If it doesn't work, get a couple of witnesses. If that don't work, then get the body of Christ. If that don't work, then leave him alone. But you don't want to gang up on your preacher. You got to hear me. Korah was ticked off at Moses because he was in disagreement what Moses was doing. And he herded up these 250 of the leaders. He had Dathan and Abiram. He had brought all of them up to challenge and deride their leader. I'm going to let that sink for a minute because I just went through that a little while ago with this church. And, uh, and when that happened, I'll just tell you right now, when that happened, I didn't get mad. I didn't get angry. I didn't chide anybody. I went to prayer. And I asked God to forgive all those people who gang mobbed me over an issue because they really didn't understand what they were doing. They didn't mean any harm. They weren't trying to be unkind to me. They were upset over something. And because they were upset, they just ganged me. But, but you got to hear me. I mean, it's fine. There's, everything's forgiven. God's pardoned everybody. I'm okay. I'm saved. Everything's fine. But when they did that to Moses, Moses, Moses' God flipped out on him. You got to watch out. God sometimes will flip out on you. He'll do some stuff that's unexpected. When they did that, when that Korah got a hold and started chewing out Moses because he didn't like what he was doing, God turned around, came down in a cloud, said, Moses, get away from these people. I'm going to kill everybody. Even if Moses was wrong in what he was doing, he said, never mind. I'll protect you. He turned around. He said, get away from these guys. And the Bible says fire came out from the presence of God. And then the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, his wife, his children, and everything he had. Licked up the dust and God said, next. Now that's scary. That's scary. Now don't walk out here saying, Brother Arnold saying, we can't disagree. Yes, you can. You certainly can. You've got a God-given right to. But you don't have a God-given right to attack me as a mob. You, you cannot do stuff like that. You have to. You have to come to somebody in pride. Uh, let, me, let me show you something. In the Old Testament, the anointing on God's people was far beyond what we embrace as Holy Ghost filled people. We don't think much about it because almost everybody's got the Holy, anybody's got the Holy Ghost is anointed. They're anointed. They, they may be disappointing, but they're anointed. They may be disobedient, but they're anointed. See, how we live and how we conduct ourselves will determine whether the anointing diminishes, disappears, or works. Because if we are not constantly renewed and refreshed in the Holy Ghost, we can get in trouble because the oil loses its viscosity. It loses its ability to lubricate. And so that's why David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And he's not even talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost like we experience under this day of grace. But he was turning around saying, you know what? One anointing ain't enough. And if we're not careful, we Pentecostals, and not mainly you because you're really the backbone of this whole church. You come Wednesday after Wednesday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But there's a lot of people that come to church here and they've had one anointing. They ain't been anointed since they was first anointed. They don't ever break down. They don't ever break through. They don't ever find a place of repentance. There's never a hungering and a thirsting. There needs to be a cry in your heart and my heart. Lord, I need to be anointed with fresh oil. I need a renewing. I need a, 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 a resurge of something. I... I I need to be made afresh again. Doesn't mean you're lost. It doesn't mean that you don't have the Holy Ghost. It could mean that if we're living at that one anointing level, we're not much threat to hell and we're not much good to God. Now, now watch how the, the, the Old Testament people 
esteem the anointing way beyond what Pentecostal people do. And shame on us. When they get ready and Saul keeps chasing David and God keeps protecting David and then finally Saul ends up in the cave asleep and David was hiding in the cave and one of his men, Abner, turns around and he says, here's the day you waited for. The Lord has delivered your enemy into your hand. He said, let me strike him and I'll just strike him once to the ground and he won't bother you anymore. And David turns and looks at him knowing that he meant well and that he had been hunting his boss for a long time. He said, in essence, he said, you're talking foolish, Abner. He said, who can put his hand against the Lord's anointed and not be guilty? Now, now, so you don't walk out of here thinking this is the, the Pope and the dope. No, that ain't the way it works. These people in this church, if they're born again, spirit-filled people, they're all anointed. You cannot go against your brother or your sister. Never mind the pulpit and the pew. I'm talking about our fellow believers. Who can attack the anointed? And not be guilty before God. And, and, and sometimes, it's quiet right now. Sometimes we do it unintentionally with words. With looks. With deliberate. What am I going What's the word? I'm about? Deliberate uh, passing by them and don't even talk to them. All the people of the Lord are anointed. According to 1 Corinthians one twenty one. the people of the Lord are anointed by God. You're anointed. God gave you the Holy Ghost. He anointed you. Now, you, you might as well be honest that most of the time, all of us are not operating and living in the fullness of that anointing as we'd like to. I mean, when Jesus laid hands on people, when the early first century church laid hands on people, that anointing went So apparently, something in the flesh, something in our psyche, our minds, can hinder that anointing. It could be not even sin. It could be just the day's activities. The chemical changes in your body throughout a week. The loss of somebody, or the loss of a job, or a problem in the house, or... There's so many things that can come to pass in our lives that seem to be barriers and blockades. You haven't lost your anointing, but the anointing has been hindered. I'm talking good. I'm talking good. I'm talking good, man. And, and, and you've got to understand something, that the same anointing that came on David, because Samuel anointed him, with holy oil. And the Bible said when he got the oil on him, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Okay? So one was symbolic and one was substance. Okay? Now watch. The same oil and the same symbolism was used by the same prophet Samuel to go on Saul. And the Spirit of the Lord shall come upon thee, and thou shalt be turned into another man. Listen carefully. It is essential that you and I be turned into a new creature. That doesn't mean we'll stay turned. There is an aspect of living for God called renewal. Refreshing. Now watch. You, you can lose, now some people don't believe that, but I do. You can lose the anointing. You can become offensive to God and God just take back his anointing. If you don't believe it, that's fine. And if you don't believe you can lose it, good. Then through disobedience and bad conduct and wrong behavior, it can be so diminished, it's just like it's depleted. Because Saul you can only find was anointed in the scriptures one time. Amen. 
Now David was anointed one time, but he kept praying, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. See, the difference between King Saul and Moses and David is simply this. Moses and David kept going back into the presence of God. Once Saul got anointed, you can't ever find him in the presence of God. Because he's like some Pentecostals. One dip will do you. Moses kept going back into that cloud. David kept going back into the presence of God, pouring his heart out. Cleanse me, forgive me, help me, turn me around. I'm sorry. And when people do that, you know what God does? Whoa, oh, here's a little more oil. Here's a little more oil. Okay. Because the oil, because the oil is designed by God to be the essence of his being. So that our lives are lived in victory, not because we are spiritual or because we are studious or because we are worshipful. No, it's because we have become a pathway that the anointing can flow and operate in our lives. The only reason David danced before the ark when they brought the ark back was he released the anointing to make him act up. You know what would happen to this church if you sweet people that you're anointed, if you would just one day decide to let the anointing take over? I mean, some of you might just jump up and this would be life-changing. Glory. I mean, if some of you just ever went like this, hallelujah. Man, we know the Lord's coming if you just go, hallelujah. And see, you say, well, I'm not emotional. That's not the issue. Are you anointed? And is the anointing allowed to operate in your life or are you quenching the spirit? Let me go a little further. And how many of us, I didn't say you, us, it's been too long in our lives since we have been anointed with fresh oil. Not a different oil, just fresh oil. You know what it is to somehow get a fresh touch from the Lord? A fresh song in the night? A fresh sense of joy? A fresh uplifting of your faith? There's a fresh something that comes? If it'll happen in a marriage, it'll happen in walking with God. You're not going to have much of a marriage if you keep pointing back to 17 years ago to your marriage certificate. Listen, Gertrude, I kissed you that day. What's your problem? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Boy, did I just strike fire. Woo! Mm-mm-mm-mm. According to first, can you get me a scripture? Could you get me First Corinthians two nine? According to the scripture. Now I'm not talking about I'm talking about symbolism, and I'm talking about substance. The dove, the, 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 the olive leaf, the oil. That's symbolic, but the substance is God, and we must not settle for symbolism. We must have the genuine, real, Holy Ghost working in our bodies and our minds and our spirits. That's why the Bible said, There shall be in you a river of life springing up into eternal life. How many times have I told you in the Old Testament with Isaac that the Philistines kept filling the wells full of debris and boulders and rocks, all the wells that his father Abraham had built, the Philistines kept filling them with debris. Why? Because that's the Philistines' job, to stop the flow. That's the devil's job. That's this world's job. That's false doctrine's job. That's make-believe saint's job, is to fill the well so it doesn't spring up. And sometimes you can be just as spiritual as someone who's dancing and talking in tongues if you're in a tough time right now and you're taking out boulders. 
They're rejoicing and running the aisles right now. You're taking out junk and trash. Don't get discouraged, because as soon as you get the debris out, the water's coming back. And nobody else is responsible for taking the debris out of my well. i got to take it out. A good church service can't do it. And most of us usually know exactly when it happened and where it happened. I don't know how many times in my life, my own life, I've lost my joy over people. Not over sin, over people. Over things said, over looks given, over attitudes shown. I'm supposed to be dynamic Jeff. I live in a world you know nothing about. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And sometimes just, just people just bash you with stuff. And it's almost like the adversary, oh, there's another boulder for your well. And then somebody hurts your feelings. Yeah. And then somebody just does something unkind to you and his five shovels full. And then the adversary steps back when you have a new temptation and trial and says, where's the water? <coughs> There's sometimes, like Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, you can sing to the water and say, spring up, oh well. But, th but there's other times when the well has been stopped by your adversary, by a wrong attitude, by getting your feelings hurt, by allowing yourself to get bitter, frustrated, upset, angry. And, and you might as well stop blaming the choir and blaming the preacher and blaming this church. You might as well just turn around, put your gloves on, and start emptying out the well. And we are silly people to think somebody else should take the rocks out of our well. That's crazy. Look, look, look at your neighbor and turn around and say, I think he's talking about you, because I know it's not me. Read, read for me, Rev. Listen to what this man is going to say. Read this. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now watch this. It hasn't even entered, but read the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now watch. There's one of the blessings of the anointing, the real anointing. It allows us to learn spiritual truths that the natural man knows nothing about. For the Spirit so, searcheth right. all things, yea, yea the, the deep, deep things, things of God. God. Go ahead. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit, spirit of man, the man, which is in him. And who even, knows the things of God? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the, but spirit, the spirit of, of God. God. Go ahead. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us now watch what he just of said. God. When you get the substance of the Spirit... Not the symbol, not the symbol, the substance of the Spirit. It opens up an avenue of revelation to you that you cannot get just from studying. There are supernatural secrets that God will give to you if your anointing is fresh. Has anybody besides me ever been through a season like this where it just seemed like for a few days or a few weeks, whew, man, the Word is coming alive, the Holy Ghost is impressing, the Spirit of God is, man, I, I feel like I'm on a roller coaster, man. God is showing me stuff, and I'm seeing stuff like I've never seen, and I'm, I'm understanding like I've never understood, and then it just shuts down. Well, what was that? It was the anointing doing the appointing. In other words, the Spirit of God shows you things, reveals things, manifests things. Because verse 14 of that scripture says, For the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he discern them. He can't understand them. Why? Because he's natural and the things of God are spiritual. One is on this plane, one is on that plane. 
But the anointing does this to the natural man. Come on up. And then when he gives us that anointing, he says, okay, go back and deal with everybody. Watch. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I haven't got to my Bible study yet because I'm on a roll right now. I really am. Because, because the issue is oil. Well, the issue is oil. You got to hear me. This woman's husband was a servant of God. Now, we don't know. And if you know, please inform me after the service. I don't know. I have never found anywhere where the scripture says what happened to her husband. Either he, he was a servant of the Lord, so he was the son of the prophets. So he was either killed by Jezebel because she murdered a bunch of prophets. Or possibly he was one of those hundred prophets that that uh, what's his name uh, hid Obadiah hid in the cave by fifties and hid them hid uh, fed them with bread and water. We don't know, and we don't even know whether those prophets ever died or not. We don't know that either. But somehow he says, "My husband, your servant, served the Lord and feared the Lord," and and apparently she's saying he's not here now. I don't know whether he's dead. He's a captive. I don't know, but he's not here now. Watch. And the creditor has come. And the creditor, watch, wants to take my future. Never mind my past. He wants my tomorrow. Because if she is a widow, the only help she has for resource is her two boys. And the adversary is so evil and nasty, he wants to take away her only resource. Don't you get it? The evil one fights you and I, not just to get us lost. He wants to steal the next generation from us if he can steal it. Now, I know at least 10 or 15 times in these 30 plus years I have made reference to this because it's one of my candy sticks. I know I've made reference to it. It's over in, it's over in Kings. Uh, let me see if I find it. Second Kings, yeah. You don't have to read it there. I'll just quote it. Second Kings where it talks about the king of Moab was fighting against the people of Israel. And he tried to break through the lines and he couldn't break through. And he tried again and he couldn't break through. So watch. He sacrificed his own son on the wall. How many times have I told you? If you don't have a breakthrough, you're going to give away the next generation. You're going to kill it. How are you going to kill it? You're going to raise a generation in this church that's never seen a miracle. We're going to raise a generation in this church that doesn't even believe in talking in tongues. We raise a generation that's never heard a message or interpretation or a prophecy. God help us. So, so when that king couldn't break through, that to me is a picture. That's a symbol, and here's the substance. We need to break through. We need a fresh touch of the throne of grace. We need to be able to have God refresh us and restore us and renew us. Am I talking good yet? I'm 71. I'm having fun. I'm 71. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you again. Do we possess what we proclaim? Have you got the Holy Ghost? Or did you just get the Holy Ghost some years ago? Where are you now? What is the viscosity of your oil? Could everyone in the house, me first, be ready to be anointed with fresh oil? And somehow, some way, I could have a fresh anointing? You know, it, it, it blows my mind that David was no match for Goliath. Come on, you ain't got to be crazy. He was no match. Goliath's a freck. I mean, David's a freckle-faced little teenage kid. This guy's a nine-and-a-half-foot giant. He's a champion. He's a man of war. But watch this. A non-anointed giant met a little anointed boy, and the giant had to go. Don't ever write yourself off just because you seem small and you seem inferior. That anointing that is inside you, if you can get it to work for you, can take out some big enemies. That's 
why the Lord constantly gave us that scripture. Not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not just doctrine. Although we need doctrine to be right, it has to be doctrine and demonstration. I've said it to you at least 15, 20 times. Doctrine without demonstration produces frustration. Doctrine with demonstration produces transformation. Didn't James say, show me your faith without your works? And I'll show you my faith by my word. So you people that say you have faith, symbolism. But there's some people that have faith, substance. I don't want to just be a hearer of the word. I want to be a doer of the word. I want God to work in my life. I want God to take control of my life. I want that fresh oil working in my life. I really do. I don't think I'm backslide, slid. I just don't think I'm up to par. I think somehow there's room in my life for improvement. Am I okay? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I just, I'm just an old guy. Just, just help me. The Bible said in Acts... I think it's 1038, how God anointed the man Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power. That has always been a perplexing scripture to me. Where's Sister Treadway? She's the Bible lady. That's a, oh, and, and there's Charleston. There's the other Hebrew guru. We'll ask you two people here. That, uh, could you explain that to me next week, please? How is it that God anointed the man Jesus with two things, the Holy Ghost and power? Does that mean you can have the Holy Ghost and no power? Said how he anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost in power. And is a conjunction, joining two thoughts together. In power. When normally we think, well, when you get the, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witness unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Is it possible that we can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the supernatural anointing of God, and yet it never act in power in our life? Maybe this week we all just start praying just a few minutes every day and say, Lord, I really believe you gave me the Holy Ghost, but I'd like to know where's the power? Is the power hidden in the Holy Ghost and I don't know how to release it? Or is the Holy Ghost separate from the power? You should see what I'm just looking at. Do we believe this? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all manner of sickness and disease, for God was with him. So now let's ask the question, is God with you? If he's with you, how come you've got him hidden so well? If he is greater than the genie that's in the little box and the lamp and the Aladdin rubbed the lamp and the genie came out and says, what can I do for you? Do we have God in a little genie bottle and we only let him out in little parts? I didn't say you, I said we. I went in to see Ellen after I heard about that unfortunate mistake that that assistant nurse made and messed up her leg, picked it up, and the stepmom was there, and he said when she picked it up and went to turn, it went pop. And they just went, oh, my God, it popped. And then the knee just swole up, and she showed me the scar in her leg. It was going like this. She said, I was getting ready to get out. My leg was straight. Now my leg's over this way. So somebody was there with us, and I said, we need to pray for God to unpop that knee. So I said, come on. So let's, let's pray. I said, put your hand on her knee. And I put my hand on her knee, and I said, Lord, pop.
pop this thing back in the right way. Just put it back in the right way so it'll be straight. Well, I went back to see her yesterday, and she said, you'll never guess what happened, brother. I want my knees straight. <laughs> Her knee is still swollen from the damage to the tendons and the muscles and the ligaments. But the doctor looked and said, as far as we can see, your knee is straight. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, it worked. Here's the other problem you have. When you're a preacher, when I'm preaching, I can usually sense and feel when I'm really getting anointed. In fact, when I'm really super anointed, the audience will say amen. Some of you, when I'm so anointed, I'm almost off this planet. Some of you will go, glory. So I know we're having a great move of God. But there are times when I am anointed to pray for people, I feel nothing. But I'm still anointed because my feelings have nothing to do with the anointing. It's nice to feel the anointing, but you don't have to feel it to be anointing. You got the Holy Ghost, raise your hands. Put your hands right at your face. Look at your hands and say, hey you, you're already anointed. Believe when you pray for somebody, something's going to happen. Because the issue is the oil. It's the oil. If this gal doesn't get a miracle of oil, she loses her future. If this church doesn't get a fresh anointing and a moving of Holy Ghost oil, we are going to lose our tomorrow. Man, I'm sorry I'm taking so long here. I got... This is... How many times have I told you, when Elijah went away, and the mantle came flying down, and the sons of the prophets were in the hills watching. See, those sons of the prophets, all their relatives go to church here. Yeah, they're a generation of spectators and watchers. They can't heal nobody. They don't ever win nobody. They don't cast no devils out of nobody. They don't witness to nobody. They just come and watch. They're not an asset to heaven and no threat to hell. They just watch. And they have a whole group with them. Let's watch. And so the, Elijah picks up that mantle, goes back to the Jordan. Now watch. This is so powerful. The sons of the prophets say, you can read it in Kings. They say, well, let's see what happens here. And when Elijah turns, watch. They are watching the man. The river is watching the mantle. Because people recognize people and the river recognizes anointing. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where he's always been on the throne of glory. The master of the universe, the king of glory, the great I am. And when he slapped that river with that thing, that river saw the anointing and felt the anointing. It didn't see the man. We are incidental to this work. We just need to be instruments through which God can work. When that anointing hit that river, it rolled back. Elisha went across, watch. And now the spectators said, Umgawa, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. What did that mean? You get more followers when you have a demonstration. The lukewarm and the half backslid will get in the game. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> now watch. The Lord turns around and has Elisha come into this woman's life. 
Look, Samson's on his way to Timnath. He's anointed. Little stupid, but anointed. Little egotistical, but anointed. And the Bible said a young lion roared out against him. Now watch, this is funny. A ferocious adversary meant an anointed adversary. And when it was over, the lion's carcass became a beehive. A storehouse for honey. You're not getting it yet. You have got a hidden ferocity in you that you need to learn how to let come out. The world wants to intimidate you. The devil wants to intimidate you. Your situation wants to intimidate you. That's when you need to say, anointing of the Holy Ghost, work in me, move in me, speak through me, give me the words to say so I can do a work for you. You're anointed. Don't be intimidated because you don't feel nothing. Don't be intimidated because your resource is minimal. Watch this. The only thing between this lady and bankruptcy and disaster in the future is a pot of oil. Let me ask you, and what do you have? Think about it. What do you have? The prophet said, what do you got in your house? She said, I ain't got nothing but a pot of oil. It's almost like the prophet said, that's enough. He said, why? Because the God I serve is a God of seed. Give me the seed. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. The Lord's already given me a picture of this. You're going to get a multiplying of oil. But first you need vessels. So now watch. The sons that were going to be sold into slavery got involved with the miracle. If you're going to get a miracle, you need everybody involved. If we're going to have a miracle, signs and wonders church, we need everybody in this place involved. We don't need a bunch of spectators. We need participators. Well, I wasn't going to say this, but I'll never be 71 again, so I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. I check Gail with the She's for Christ offering, and I want to commend you for the She's for Christ offering. You gave $22,000 to She's for Christ this year. That was phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what I said to Gail, is Gail here? Is she? No, she, oh, there she is back. What I said to Gail is, you know, Gail, the only thing that bothers me and I know you could give me the list, and I put it up on the screen of all the people that didn't give to She's for Christ. But then I had to put all the same people who don't give to the building fund, who don't give to foreign missions, and don't give to the general's fund. And I did not tell you, Gail, I said, the thing that bothers me, and I try to help people with their tithing and their giving, is because when you don't tithe and you don't give, you handcuff God. And God wants to bless you but it violates his holy nature and you refuse to let him bless you. Didn't I say it? The second point is we got a church that's got a bunch of hobos in it. You don't know what a hobo is. A freeloader. A welfare saint. Everybody else pays the bills and you ride for free. Everybody else sacrifices to pay for this, buy the van, buy the video, do all that. And this certain class of people, hobos, freeloaders, hitchhikers. You pay the insurance, you pay the payments on the van, you pay for this. I just come and enjoy it. I'm just a freeloader. I said, you're not a freeloader, you're a Democrat. That's what you are. You're not a freeloader. You're a Democrat. You're a welfare whacker. Let everybody else pay for everything. Now, I know you're laughing because you say, oh, you're so funny. Well, well, that's how the Democratic Party works. It's all handouts and welfare. Yeah. And if you're a Democrat, don't get offended. You just need to change parties. <laughs> I'm 
now I'm, now I see, now I'm losing my anointing right now. And I'm, You don't realize how you could be blessed of God if you stop being a freeloader. If you stop being a hobo. If you stop being a hitchhiker. If you, it's not that the church needs your money. It doesn't need your money. You need to contribute. You need to be a part of this. You need to be able to be a blessing to others. Didn't he say it is more blessed to give than it is to receive? Okay, that was a commercial. It was off the. I just had to get that off my chest. That's it. I just. Church will go on. I don't care. We got 100 people in this church. Don't give nothing or nothing. Fine. You're welcome to come here and come. We'll treat you good. We won't, we won't be mean to you. But we'll know that you're a hobo. You ought to bring your own toilet paper. Don't use ours. Don't use our hand wipes. Don't use our soap. Bring your own. You can use our sink. Now you're laughing, but you could ask Gail. It was a few years ago when we used to put these little things of hand soap in the ladies' bathroom and the men's bathroom. They got stolen every two weeks. We put rolls of, of papers in the bathrooms. And we had people in this church taking rolls out of here, taking toilet tissue and going home. Democrats everywhere. That's insane. We, we did a wedding one year. We don't do it anymore. We, we let people from other denominations use our church for a wedding. And we had a big con conclave here and a big wedding. And these people all came in here and they took care of the church. When they left, everything in the bathroom, all of the, even the air fresheners was gone. The only good thing was they were gone also. this thing with pens week after week after week. I ain't got one now. I hope you're able to do your homework okay. I ain't got a pen in the whole thing. I had a little box I put up here that I kept handkerchiefs in for me and preachers. I finally got rid of the box. Every handkerchief was stolen at me. I'm almost done. I'll be better when I'm 72. He turns around and tells her, okay, look, God's going to give you a miracle, but you're going to have to cooperate with it. He said, I want you to go borrow his vessels, borrow empty vessels, and borrow not a few. Now watch. Watch what he didn't say. You can only use a certain color. I'm only going to fill a certain color. Buddy, any color is welcome in this place. Any culture is worth in this place. Any educative level is welcome in this place. Broken people are welcome in this place. I wonder how many of those pots he picked up were crack pots. done. said, go borrow vessels, borrow not a few. So what is Elisha saying? Expect the miraculous. Now watch what he said. Oh, by the way, and you are going to determine the size of your miracle by how much you're willing to get involved with it. You determine the size. And 
And those boys kept bringing those, those vessels in. And I wonder what would have happened if one of those boys would have said, Well, Mom, what if? See, that damnable devil is always there every time you step out in faith and take a risk. What if? What if it doesn't work? What if the preacher was mistaken? What if that's not what God meant? you got to get rid of that what if spirit and say, if God be for me, it does not matter who or what is against me. Okay, i got, I got to go. I, 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 I'm just going to... I'm just going to close this. Just, I'm going to close this. I'm talking good. Good. Hey, Phil, the old man's all right tonight, baby. He's all right. I'd be tough if I could see. Here, here's the part I wanted to get to. He said, now when you get the vessels, then pour out. And when you pour out, set aside what is full. Now, it must have been mind-boggling to her because... Miracles from God cannot be figured out and they don't make no sense. If you got a little pot of oil and you start pouring it out and it pours out vessel after vessel, I guarantee that woman must have went. So I don't know whether God was multiplying it while it was in there or while it was coming out. I don't know. But all I know is she kept pouring out and filling these jugs and filling these jugs and filling these jugs. And the Bible said she filled those jugs and set them aside. And finally she said, bring me yet another vessel. And the boy said, there ain't no more vessels. Watch what it said. And the miracle stopped. You said, well, it didn't say that. Yes, it did. It said the oil stayed. That means the miracle stopped. In other words, the multiplicity of oil shut down. Why? God ain't given to oil when there ain't no vessels. That's why we need a house full of people. Why? Because the oil is, is not the problem. The empty containers is the problem. I, I, I'm trying to close right now. I, I didn't get finished. I'm just going to close, okay? Watch this. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Turn around and says, now when you bring the vessels into the house, watch this. Shut the door upon you and your sons. Now that is a sermon by itself. There are some miracles that will never happen in our lives until we shut the door on some things. We got to stop letting some things go on in our life. We got to stop letting other things come into our life. We got to shut out some things and shut ourselves in. He didn't say, do the miracle while the door's open. He said, oh, no. No, no, it's got to be private. You shut the door to everything else. Sometimes that's the biggest problem that I have. I don't shut the door to my day's activities when I get ready to pray. I don't shut the door when I get ready to do some things. And God is saying, shut the door. Shut the door. I'll do the miracle in the private. I'll do the miracle in your heart. Shut the door and don't let other stuff interfere with you. You stand. I'm done at 71. Hallelujah. The issue is the oil. Why? Because the oil paid her debt, and gave her a guaranteed future. He said, pay thy debt, and thou and thy sons live off the rest. What is he saying? If you work with God, God can give you such a miracle, it will outmatch anything you were thinking about. She's just trying to take care of a debt, and God said, never mind the debt. I'll take care of your debt and your tomorrow. Lord, bless everybody and give them a good night's rest. Please continue to show mercy to the Holy family and protect them and help them and encourage Karen and all the crew and Nana Holly and everybody. Bless them and be with Ellen and be with Mary and just help them, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Shake hands, be friendly. Thank you again for a wonderful She's for Christ offering. If you still want to give some you haven't given, we, we're going to send it off till Sunday anyway. And, They'll take everything we give them. <laughs>